Since Dune Part 2, Denis Villeneuve has once again shown he's one of the top directors working today. So it's time to stop and rank each of Denis Villeneuve's Hollywood films from the one that I don't really care for to a whole bunch of the best. My name is Sean and I love to talk about movies way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of Denny Villeneuve's films. My list is not the right list, it's just my list and I would love to see yours. As we go into this, I really wanted to include his French Canadian films, but the month didn't go as planned. I wasn't able to get them watched. I'm disappointed in myself, I wasn't able to make it happen, but it is what it is. Today's video is brought to you by Raycon. It's that time of the year where the sun has come back out and everything is better with my Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Raycons offer amazing quality sound at half the price of other premium brands. Raycons optimized gel tips are designed to fit comfortably in your ears to actually stay there. Whether you're going for a jog or mowing your lawn, they've got eight hours of playtime, 32 hours of battery life, so I don't have to worry about whether they're gonna die midday. They have three customizable sound profiles so you can get the ideal sound whether listening to music or an audiobook or podcast and then they have a sound isolation mode if I want to cancel out some of the noise around me or they have an awareness mode so I can have nice full music in my ears but still be able to hear my kids and know if they're up to no good. The thing I really love about them is that they just like disappear into my ears and I kind of forget that they're there. Go to buyraycon.com slash Sean Chandler today to get get 20% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. That's right, you'll get 20% off and free shipping at buyraycon.com slash Sean Chandler. The link is down below in the description and let's get started. Last Enemy, and this is the only film from Villeneuve that I've seen that just really isn't for me. Intentionally surreal, metaphoric films typically just aren't on my wavelength. And so I can watch them and see the technical skill on display. I can appreciate that other people are into them, but for me, I just don't connect with this type of film. So when it specifically comes to enemy, you know, I was intrigued by the mystery. And so that kind of drew me into it, but the movie isn't particularly interested in giving definitive answers for everything that's going on in any sort of literal sense which can make for great cinematic art where the viewer is left to interpret it and have their own idea of what all of it specifically means. But I'm just not wired to watch a movie and find that satisfying. But it also wasn't a film that I got anything out of personally. And I think some of that might even be the specific themes that he was wanting to explore and where he wanted to go with this journey. This movie is a documentary about my subconscious or a documentary about Jake Gyllenhaal's subconscious. I don't know which one now. <laughs> I cannot talk about the spider because I need more therapy. It's a film that starts out weird and it keeps getting weirder and it ends on the weirdest of notes and that was entirely intentional on his part. If you haven't seen the film, I am gonna kind of spoil the final reveal of it. It ends on this final image of a spider, which to Villeneuve was extraordinarily important. I was trying to convey a, a sensation, massive inner terror. It's uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's character finally facing his inner self. For me, it's a, I was looking for a perfect image that will uh, say something specific about sexuality and uh, subconscious of a man. And I, I, for me, it was a perfect image. That's his favorite shot of the movie. That's what it was all building towards, that he just wanted to have this image that captured that emotion. But that's exactly the sort of thing that doesn't resonate with me whatsoever. Huge gap. Then number six, Arrival. To be perfectly clear, I can respect Enemy, but I'm not really into it at all. It's not for me. The next six movies, including number six, Arrival, are all movies that are like top 10 of the year for me. I think they're all great. That brings us to Arrival, which is true cerebral sci-fi. It is about aliens showing up, but it's not a big action movie. It's about the linguistic process and how do we connect. And what's so cool about this is that it takes something that most of us have very little knowledge about or interest in, linguistics, 
and builds a film out of it. And it manages to be fascinating and accessible. And in fact, Danny Villeneuve was interested in adapting this short story into a film, but was a little bit hesitant for a while because he wasn't quite sure how to crack the code of the script. I just deeply felt in love with the short story. I have no time to write a screenplay. And to be honest with you guys, I don't know how to crack that short story because it's very intellectual. But from a dramatic point of view, it's, it's a bit difficult to, to articulate because it's, a, it's about process. And then it starts incorporating in all these high level linguistic ideas like the Sapphire Worth hypothesis, linguistic relativity that normal people don't care about. And it makes it accessible. The way that it was constructed, you can't just over clarify something or oversimplify something. You can't have a, just a mountain of exposition. We didn't want a $40 million TED talk. Through telling this alien story, taking it to this extreme fantastical level, bringing foreknowledge into the mix, which once again makes you think about language in a way that we've never done before and stop to think, what if language and our perception of reality was quite different from our current understanding of it? I didn't want something that can relate to any human language, something, a language that is coming from another way of thinking. It's also very personal and it takes this idea of foreknowledge and incorporates it into this story that's about life, love, family, children, and loss. What's so clever about the film is that it's able to use these high-level linguistic ideas, the sci-fi twist about it having foreknowledge, and integrate that into the storytelling. So the audience believes that we're seeing the aftermath of loss, when in fact, we're seeing the setup for the loss. And that's when you're doing something really special, when you can have a compelling narrative that has tension inside of it, it has human emotion to it, and also makes your audience think. Now, I am someone that enjoys bigger spectacle action, so some of the other ones on this list are just more to my flavor and taste. Number five, Sicario. Here, Villeneuve takes what could be a fairly straightforward story about someone being recruited to battle the drug dealers and manages to craft this endlessly tense thriller, which delivers thrilling and exciting action sequences while at the exact same time stewing in the moral ambiguity of it all. I mean, so much of what makes this movie work is that there's just this constant lingering sense of tension from the very beginning that works in the individual sequences where as you go into them, you know something is about to snap, pop, explode. Something bad is coming as you enter every single scene, all while sitting in this scenario of questioning how far is too far. At what point in time do the good guys become the bad guys? And go in a zone of danger and they will be beyond law and, 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 and uh, they, they will do something that is illegal. And the idea that it was to embrace the sky. Another reason a lot of this works is that the film is largely seen from Kate's perspective and she's brought into this world where she doesn't fully understand the mission she's on. Therefore, those are all mysteries that we as the audience have as well. And so one of the key ones in here is Benicio Del Toro. And he doesn't have to say much. And you kind of know so much at the exact same time, but in the right way, the right kind of mysteries of like, who is this guy? He seems, he seems like he's up to no good. And then as we kind of move through the film and finally it's revealed what's driving him, his motivation, it makes a scenario where we want the payoff of that. Like we are rooting for him to get his revenge. And when it finally pays that all off, when the tension of the whole film of build, we've been building the tension to the scene where we finally get the release, and then it's the most horrifying scene in the movie. And that's the payoff we've been waiting for. And you get the revenge, but do you even want it? And that's what the movie does so well, is live in that and allow it to exist and leaves the audience questioning what's right 
what's wrong, and how should I feel about this? Fourth, Prisoners. In a lot of ways, I find Sicario and Prisoners to be very similar films. Now, obviously, on a narrative level, they're very different. One is about kidnapped girls, the other one is about drug dealers. But both of them deal with protagonist lead characters with a good, noble goal who do immoral things in the process of trying to achieve that noble goal. And both of them are just these pressure cooker movies that just have this slow building dread from the very beginning all the way up until the very end. It's like a, a shot that express a pressure of time and that wants to bring the idea that something ominous is about to happen. And like Sicario, this is another film where on paper, it could just be another genre film. In the case of this one, the kidnapped child and the investigation to find the child. But once again, through the layered storytelling, complex characters, symbolism, it's elevated to this whole other level. As an audience member, we're thrown into the middle of this mystery and we're just trying to piece together all of these clues. And you, you know this ties in somehow, but it never ties in the way you think it's going to tie in. There's always a twist on everything. The whole movie is, uses this imagery of the maze where essentially each of our characters are prisoners of a metaphoric maze and sometimes a literal maze. We see how they try to do this based off their backgrounds, based off their skill sets, based off their emotional connection to the mystery itself. So the father is emotionally compromised, therefore does more and more desperate things in his attempt to save his child. And you see a man that at the beginning, clearly intense, but a good man of character descending into chaos, madness and cruelty and abandoning the family that he still has in pursuit of the lost child and the detective trying to do the right thing. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of Villeneuve's films. My list is not the right list. It's just my list and I would love to see yours. And as I said before, Enemy, clearly in last place, but the rest of these I think are pretty great and there's not like gigantic gaps between any of them. On a different day of the week, perhaps the ranking could be a different order. If you like these types of director rankings, I've done a ton of them. Uh, last year I did Scorsese as well as Spielberg, but I've done most of the great directors, Tarantino. If you like this type of content, check out that playlist for more videos just like this. In third, Blade Runner 2049. And as I'm starting to record this, I'm looking at my display and realizing this is really nice color coordination. I didn't even mean to do that. I just popped that graphic up there and went, Oh, wow, that goes really nicely with my lights. <laughs> anyway, I've said it many times before. I feel Blade Runner 2049 is a better version of what the original Blade Runner was going for. And I think a lot of that goes back to what I said when discussing Enemy. Of I'm just not on the same wavelength with some of the ways that it tackles its ideas, its ambiguity, how it can be poetic, metaphoric. And I feel with Blade Runner 2049, it still has that exploration of what does it mean to be human, but it's less poetic, thus more on my wavelength. And even in kind of discussions of Blade Runner 2049, uh, there's a video put out there where they asked Denny what is his favorite shot from each of his movies. And you expect, because his movies are so gorgeous, and we'll start talking about that in just a second, that he would pick one of those moments. But he almost always went to a personal moment. That shot and right the shot after of his hand being still uh, and of a, a sleeping being that I thought was absolutely moving for me to shoot. For a film like Blade Runner, a lot of people pick out the big landscapes, the colorful mm. shots and the silhouettes, but why do you feel like you connect with those smaller intimate shots? Because there's so much humanity uh, in, in these shots. And, and maybe that's just why I connected with it a little bit more because it's just anchored a little bit more in the characters and in the humanity in a way that worked for me or it's more on my wavelength. Of course, the other thing that you have to talk about with a movie like this is just the tremendous production design. Like this is a gorgeous movie top to bottom. Of course, it's building off all the work that Ridley Scott and his crew did 
40 years ago. You can build on top of that with all of this modern technology. In interviews, Denny has talked about how his origins were in documentary filmmaking. He's putting images on the screen that are not of real places, that are not of real things but trying to have that same energy and immersiveness that comes with documentary filmmaking and doing everything in his power to make these images believable and real. And I think he does a fantastic job of it. And when you make such a, an immersive world, but also pay so much attention to the characters, the details, the little moments, you're able to explore these ideas in a way that's very profound and powerful. I know that uh, uh, my movies are usually quite immersive and, and there's like a, a strong feeling of intimacy that uh, you have to, uh, they are constructed around a, a very precise point of view. Our runner up, Dune part one. So as the part one uh, of this adaptation, this is the movie that has to carry the heavy weight of building out the world, delivering all the exposition and making you understand all the characters, factions, motivations, all of that fun stuff. And it just does a great job of being sci-fi for grownups. But a big thing that I very much respect about what was done here is that this feels like timeless sci-fi where they're, we're, they're adapting a book that's now almost 60 years old. And... Then he didn't feel like it was his job to fix it. I wanted to have the people who had read the book to feel that all the love and the respect and the reverence I had for Frank Herbert. And so I said, we will not express ourselves. We will try to bring Herbert to the screen as much as possible. I said to my crew, that's the Bible. I remember watching Peter Jackson, The Lord of the Ring. I was feeling that he had tried at his best to stay close to the description of Tolkien. And that's the sort of thing that makes a story feel timeless in the same way that the Lord of the Rings trilogy that set of films feels timeless. Along those exact same lines, there's just massive world building taking place here. And it's not just setting up all these different political factions and their motivations. It's making this world feel believable with all of the small little details of what it would take to live in a desert and all the ways that everything is thought through and feels so believable. And that was a large part of what made the books so compelling, but also made the book so difficult to translate. It's a book that takes its power into details, you know, the way Frank Herbert approached it. ecology, biology, all the different tribes, all the different uh, cultures. And I wanted to try to keep as much of the essence of it. And it felt too uh, dense for one movie. And of course, the other thing you have to talk about here is that it, like Blade Runner 2049, is an absolutely flawless production, researching sand and researching all these different things in nature so that they can adapt these crazy fantastical things, but still anchor them in reality. It all feels real and it feels massive and large scale. Once again, Denny came from that background in uh, uh, documentary filmmaking and he brings that to Arrakis. So the movie was basically designed with that scope, as you said, and, and then uh, high intimacy. There's not a lot of middle ground shots yet. It's really a landscape That's of faces. Not, exactly. And when so much of the film is practical on sets and locations, it sets the actors up for greater success as well. When I work with actors, I try to bring reality around them as much as possible in order to preserve that emotion, in order to preserve that creativity. And You know, with Marvel, I spent years acting with tennis balls. <laughs> Imagine with nothing there. Right. So the more practical it is, the more you can just kind of put that aside and just be sucked into that moment. To create an intimate bubble around the camera where everything seems as tangible as possible and real as possible for them so they can feel immersed in that world. I like to be in it. Like, I like for it to feel real. So all the, the dirt and the, all, you know, flying around and, and dust flying in your mouth while you're screaming. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, I like that. You know, it's just part of the process. It makes it, it makes it feel more real to me. When you put all those pieces together, you can go off to this distant planet way off in the future and believe it. 
But coming in at number one, Dune Part 2. You can take everything good that I said about Dune Part 1 and apply it to Dune Part 2 as well. But because the first movie had to do the hard work of laying the foundation, that means Part 2 just gets to build on top of it with a faster moving plot, characters with more fulfilling character arcs. Now, the big thing that takes place in Part 2 is watching Paul and his kind of rise to power as he fulfills the prophecy. Or does he? With the story that they're, they're telling, it's able to have a sense of victory on it as we're watching him ascent. And because the Harkonnens are so evil, because the Emperor's betrayal was so personal, there is a sense of satisfaction and victory at the end of the film of you want them to be defeated and you want our protagonist to defeat them. But it's never that simple, as it also lets us know there's more going on here. And this victory has terrible consequences. It's that subversion of the hero's journey. It has the beats of our rising chosen one fulfilling prophecies. But also, it's not that at all. At the same time, this is an extreme manipulation. Once again, you have to talk about here is how there's just not a false frame in the entire film. Everything is so believable. Oh, he will be physically able to jump on a worm, making that look real, dangerous, edgy, possible. To do that, it required a, a tremendous amount of time and research and de development. And, and it was by far the most complex sequence I ever done uh, in my life. And even as we're talking about Paul Wright surfing on top of a worm, you believe it, you buy into it because everything is so anchored in reality that even the fantastic feels real. And also these moments are treated as character moments. There's a shot where Paul finally rise on the worm. It's a shot that we uh, see his foot and finally he stand up where he becomes a Fremen, where he becomes an adult. Paul surfing on the worm means something in the story. And so how important is character to you? But it's essential to, uh, uh, when you convey a story, to find the right point of view. And once, once uh, of course, uh, you, you embrace that point of view and, and uh, it's, uh, uh, that's, that will be the, the instrument that, uh, which with you will unfold the old story. So for me, this has, I love sci-fi, big, massive stories, heroes' journeys, but heroes' journeys that are smarter than me, but also as a way to explore and flip it on its head and challenge the audience as to what it all means. You get big action, you get awesome night fights, you, you get a world that you believe in. So for me, it has all the stuff I want, it comes in at number one. If you're interested in some awesome earbuds, check out that link for Raycon down below in the description. If you want more director rankings just like this one, check out that playlist right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.